Jeremy Narby, welcome to the Plant Yourself podcast. Thank you. So there's there's so much I want to talk to you about. I feel like you know, have, having read your 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 book, The Cosmic Serpent, years ago, and now the new one, Plant Teachers, I feel like you know a great imbalance. Like I know you very well, and you don't know me at all. I just want to jump into an old friends conversation. Uh huh. Yeah, where that's have, have been and where they're going. Uh huh. Well, um, yeah, uh, uh, th that's the magical thing about books is that uh, suddenly you have a lot of people who uh, feel they know you and kind of kind of like you. And um, and it's true, you know, that when I put myself into my books, so it's a, it's a little bit of me in there. At the same time, obviously, the book and the person is always two different things. Um, so but it's a a great way to sort of uh, make friends, reach out, communicate. Um, and I can see all the books behind you. So I know you're a, a book person yourself. You know, I, I've got a whole bunch of books. Uh, oh, beautiful. Uh -huh. I, I crunch books. <laughs> well, and so, um, I mean, I, I want to make sure that we introduce you to my audience because there, there, you know, there's sort of two, pe two types of people in my life, people who have never heard of you and people ah. who who's <laughs> who read the cosmic serpent and that's like they they view that as one of the turning points in their life oh boy um uh -huh. so and i'm in and i'm in the middle right <laughs> so <Don't worry>. <laughs> so what, what should i do <laughs> so um i get i'd love just you know i know you've done you've done it a thousand times already but sort of like a little bit of you know you're sitting next to someone on an airplane and they say well uh -huh. tell me about yourself what do you do yeah, well, you know, actually, in an airplane, I'd be a little bit um, more uh, circumspect because, you know, most people, uh, if, if but so I, I, if I if I may, I'd answer differently. I'd say okay. that, you know, if uh, if we were among if you were introducing me to a, a crowd of friends who hadn't heard of me, you Perfect. know, but that, that uh, they actually kind of wanted to know, then I'd say, well, uh, I grew up in a in a bilingual family. I lived in in bilingual places, Montreal and Switzerland. I was always kind of in between cultures, and I, I was interested in why things were different from one place to another, why they were rich people and poor people and that kind of thing. I studied history. It wasn't that satisfying uh, for the young person I was then, and then I discovered anthropology, and that was exactly what the doctor had ordered to study the differences between race, class, gender. In my case, I was interested in rich and poor, World Bank on the one hand, Amazonian Indians on the other. This was in the 1980s. And actually, I was not that particularly attracted to the Amazon or its indigenous people, but for purely theoretical reasons, as a sort of a young anthropologist interested in social inequality, I mean, you can imagine the guy on the airplane listening to me is already thinking, this is telling me m way more than, <laughs> than I wanted to know, you know. But anyway. Um, right, he's yeah, back for, into his Dan Brown novel, right? <laughs> yeah, please. Um, but anyway, um, yeah, that's so uh, uh, 37 years ago, I left Stanford University's anthropology department and went down to the Amazon to study how an indigenous group there was using the rainforest in order to argue in their favor that they, they knew how to use the rainforest rationally and that their lands should not be taken away and, and cut down by so-called development uh, experts and, and schemes. So mm. that's how I kind of strolled out of the suburbs of the Western world and into the uh, Peruvian Amazon in the middle of the 1980s. And it's true that that was an experience that um, um, opened up my understanding of a lot of things, including the arrogance of my own worldview of being a young rationalist, university trained, materialist kind of guy. And you know, thinking that science knew best, and that, and so forth. And then there was this um, uh, rainforest with a, an unbelievable diversity of species. And here were these barefoot Indians, and they had names in their language for just about every species of plant, which was way more than the number of Latin names. These people knew 
plants better than all the botanists in the world. I mean, just, just for starters. Um, and yet the World Bank and other development experts were saying, these people don't know how to use the rainforest. That's why we can take their lands away in the name of development. So it started a long uh, process, as far as I was concerned, of uh, questioning uh, Western knowledge and at the same time using it to try to understand better what these people were talking about. Because actually, if you wanted to make sense of, I was living with Ashaninka people and uh, right in the middle of the Peruvian Amazon. And, and these people, they knew about plants, about how to build a house, about how to heal people. Uh, they were all musicians. In other words, there was, there was no separation between disciplines. There were no real specializations. The only specialization really was shaman. So these were people who worked with certain plants, tobacco and ayahuasca, and then they used these plants to learn about other plants and many other questions. So they had a completely different form of knowledge and a completely different approach to how you understand knowledge, that you don't separate it into all these different disciplines. So when I tried to uh, make sense of what the Ashaninka knew about the rainforest in their own terms, it actually meant looking into botany, looking into neurology, looking into psychology, um, all of these domains that were outside of my expertise at that point, but all because Western knowledge is fragmented. This was kind of like trying to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. In brief, as a cultural go-between or translator, so, you know, the guy who grew up, grew up between French and English and different uh, communities. Well, here it was going back and forth between Western knowledge and indigenous knowledge and seeing how one could get a translation going, how one could develop mutual understanding, how one could even try to put Humpty Dumpty back together again. So. That's what I've been doing for the last 37 years. Um, I'm mainly an activist and a fundraiser. So most of the time I'm doing kind of practical work, arguing in favor of initiatives of Amazonian people. But every now and then I kind of roll up my sleeves and write a book about ayahuasca or tobacco or indigenous Amazonian systems of knowledge and, and look at their possible interface with Western knowledge. I mean, the, the guy on the plane at this point is, uh, you know. Uh, that, was, that was a terrible metaphor. I, I, I retract oh, it. But that, you understand why I don't, you know, uh, I yeah. don't, uh, I'm polite. I like people on plane. I talk with them, but I, my answer is, oh, I'm an anthropologist. That's the answer. Uh -huh. <laughs> so, so one of the things I find so, I don't know if it's ironic or just fascinating, is you said, like, I went to the Amazon to argue for the low, for the indigenous people against the World Bank. And that seems to me sort of the opposite of arrogance. And yet you described you came in and you realized how arrogant your worldview was. Where's where was the well, arrogance in, well, in sure in, within um, that? So that um, you take this very well intentioned uh, young anthropologist um, and critical of the World Bank and critical of uh, the, I guess, all, uh, already a little critical of Western knowledge. Still, I had deep down certitudes like, of course, the white guy who has had the benefit of uh, a superior education knows more about reality than a barefoot Indian in the rainforest. Um, you know, I mean, they don't have microscopes. They don't know chemical atoms and molecules. They don't know all these things that I know are actually real. Um, and so, you know, I'll give you an example. Uh, uh, one day the kids in the village uh, said to me, um, so where, where is your land? C could I travel to your land? I said, well, you know, I, most of, I live in Switzerland and Switzerland's on the other side of the, the planet, you know, and they kind of looked at me um, oddly. And so I said, well, there was a, a, a grapefruit and a lemon. So I said, well, you know, I mean, uh, uh, here's the sun, the grapefruit, 
And then here's the planet that we are all on, the round planet that we are all on, the lemon. And then I started sort of, you know, uh, giving them a crash course in uh, planetary dynamics. And, and, and then I said, and so, and here's the lemon. So um, here's the Peruvian Amazon on this side and, and Switzerland is on the other side. So you'd need to take an airplane to, uh, but yeah, it would be physically possible for you folks to, to go there. And I could see that they were looking at me like, like I was really bonkers. Um, and, you know, from my point of view, these poor people had never even heard of round planets and, and any of this stuff. And, you know, I knew I was right because I saw uh, the NASA land on the moon in 1969. Um, but actually, I discovered in, in the ensuing weeks that they had a completely different view of the question. And in their view, there were different levels. And white people came from the level below. They lived underground as far as the Ashaninka were concerned. And they lived in these underground cities that were had lots of sophisticated technology. We're white because we live underground. And actually we, we emerge occasionally from lakes and we come and steal indigenous women and children and melt their body fat to make refined oil for our machines. I mean, th this is their view of things. Um, well, at the time I thought, wow, this is, a... and then I realized they actually thought I was one of these white vampires, you know, mm. uh, because what are these, they, they call them pishtacos in their language. What are these white vampires who come hunting for indigenous uh, body fat look like? Well, they have blue eyes and they have beards they're men and they have white skin. Well, that, I actually fit that, <laughs> that description. Um, and then I realized that actually their view that white people were like these uh, vampires obsessed with extracting vital energy was a pretty exact metaphor for what had just gone on for the last 500 years from their point of view. I mean, they'd seen all kinds of white extractors conquistadors all the way through to oil companies um, that have come to their world and obsessively extracted anything they could find and um, for no real understandable reason. I mean, I, I, I had Ashaninka people to ask me, why is it that white people, they're all, always interested in gold and then when you give them some gold, they only want more. Why is it that they have this like unquenchable thirst for gold? This was really puzzling to them. Um, and, you know, I, I, I'd answer, um, you know, it's a good question. And I can't, <laughs> I can't really tell you. I don't know. Um, so the arrogance is in, uh, it was actually in the worldview of like, uh, and, and then the levels of your own arrogance, uh, it, they're like um, um, onion skins. You take one layer off, then there's another. You take another layer off, and then there's another. And then finally, you, get, you, can, you can aim to get much lower down and peel away your prejudice. But you know, to, to actually, uh, it, it took me a while to unlearn some, some of these uh, uh, certitudes. Like, you know, I used to think that what animist people believed about plants was superstitious, superstitious, irrational, childish stuff, you know. And then the first Amazonian people I met who, who actually would talk to me about plants as if they were people, you know, I thought, oh my goodness, um, you know, poor things. I didn't want to say so, but, you know, I just did not believe that there were people inside plants. Um, right. So, you so know, being, I, a good being a good anthropologist meant that you sort of nod and write it down. Right. And you report back. How cute. It, kind of. Exactly right. Um, but then, but then, actually, you realize wh where you get start getting rid of the arrogance is, um, and so actually, that's pretty arrogant because you think, okay, uh, they're wrong, but I'm not going to say so. I'm going to be polite enough to look like I can, I'm an open-minded fellow and record what they say. Uh, but then when I put it into writing for my audience, I'll let them know that I'm kind of in on it and that I think it's kind of cute. And, and that is actually just filled with arrogance, if you look at it. 
And it would seem now that we uh, know more, when I say we, I mean like the international community of people on this planet who read science, uh, including Amazonian indigenous people now, um, it is obvious that actually plants are not just these uh, inert objects that I used to think they were and that my culture used to think they were. They actually are sentient, perceptive beings who communicate, remember, recognize their own kin, etc. That depending on how you define a person, yes, there is a person inside a blade of grass. In other words, there's somebody home. Just how, how that works, how you can have a somebody when you don't have a brain, how in, in just in a blade of grass that there can be a somebody. Well, this is actually a, a subject that uh, philosophers are writing books about right now. Um, 35 years ago, Western people, including myself, thought it was gibberish. So um, whereas now we see how pertinent it is. You know, so that's, that's, the, that's uh, where the arrogance is. Uh, hiding in the worldview. So you you write that what got you to loosen your grip on that worldview or to loosen its grip on you was the invitation from your the Ashaninka hosts. So if you want to understand how we see our world, you have to drink ayahuasca. Yeah, you know, it's it's true in 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 my case it's true and uh, I'll describe it but I'd also like to to qualify it a little bit ahead of time because you know it it could come across as saying well all you got to do is drink ayahuasca and presto it'll open your mind change your worldview you'll understand everything clearly et voila um, but um, unfortunately that's not true. Um, you know, I, I, if only it were that simple. Um, in my case, however, it, it actually did kind of work like that, um, which is that um, I describe this first ayahuasca experience, which occurred in 1985. I describe it in the first chapter of The Cosmic Serpent. Uh, so folks who want to see the detail can, can look at it. But it's true that I was hardly 10 minutes into th that experience, uh, confronted with uh, enormous fluorescent serpents who were, the first thing they told me was that I was just a tiny human being. That was a, like this telepathic message that, that they sent right through my forehead. And looking at them, uh, I could see that they were right and that my worldview, which was materialist, rationalist, and agnostic, um, presupposed that what my eyes were showing me didn't exist. That's where I understood the bottomless arrogance of my worldview. And then it collapsed in front of my eyes. Um, and this is a very discombobulating uh, experience. Um, and then, hundreds of thousands of other images uh, came into my mind in the ensuing couple of hours, including like the, the veins of a human hand and the veins of a green leaf going and then like, and the message was, it's the same stuff. The next day, as I was freshening up by the river, I actually took a green leaf and looked at it and touched it. And it was simply true that, um, well, maybe I was just a human being, but I, it was like be feeling reconciled with, uh, with all of nature for the first time in my life and realizing that there was this kind of artificial separation that Western culture put at that point and still now between humans on the one hand and, and all the rest. So um, yeah, uh, ayahuasca allowed me in one session um, to see that there was more to the scenario than just human beings and human-centered ideas. And, and this was, uh, I, it took me years to understand that uh, actually this was not just a very strong emotional subjective experience. It was an antidote to the anthropocentricism of anthropology. That means 
anthropology is a study of humans. So as an anthropologist, you're a human studying humans. And so you're always focusing on humans and Western culture is extremely human centered. And so as an anthropologist studying humans, you're, you're human centered down to the bank and back. And then comes this vegetal uh, brew and it, uh, and and you, suddenly you realize that whoa, there's there's something much broader going on uh, that we don't usually see, and that uh, puts the human back in its place. In other words, off the pedestal. Um, so in and then uh, it, so it's true that that single ayahuasca experience got me thinking well, wait a second, there's something to this indigenous way of approaching knowledge because the Ashanik were saying, yes, this is the vegetal mixture that allows us to see images and learn things. Well, I learned a whole ton about my worldview, its arrogance um, in, in that setting. I didn't actually know what to do with it. It took me like eight years to figure out how to start doing something with it. Actually, that's what writing the book, The Cosmic Serpent was about. It was about saying, okay, here's this experience I had eight years ago. This is what happened. And so what does it mean? What does it mean when these people say that they get knowledge about plants and many other things from the hallucinations that, that the, this plant mixture creates? How can that be possible? How can you get verifiable information from hallucinations? Um, well, um, I, I simply wanted the, the, the experience was so, so strong and marking and extraordinary uh, that it not only opened my worldview and showed me the limits of my initial worldview, it also made me want to write a book about the subject just to try to get a, uh, just to try to understand it. So yes, uh, one single ayahuasca experience was enough for changing my view of things and getting me to spend two years of my life to write a book about it without drinking any ayahuasca, I should say. Mm -hmm. Well, so, and you know, what, I mean, the book is such a, an amazing, you know, it's a, it's a detective story at its, at its core, for me, at least, where you're saying like, okay, these, um, these metaphors, these stories, these cute tales about the giant, you know, the serpents and the light beings and the people and the um, Minankari love tobacco and all the, and then you're sort of translating, as you said, into the, you know, the latest neuroscience and molecular biology of the time, which is now, I guess, 25 years ago, and, and sort of representing that what they're saying is not sort of cute and folksy, but a better, understand, a better understanding of reality, although spoken in metaphorical terms, than science, like science was catching up to it and is still catching up to it. Um, and so I guess, I mean, I just, yeah, everybody should read this book, but I'm, I'm also wondering, uh, like, it seems like you dodged a bullet in your career in not turning into like a Timothy Leary of ayahuasca. Mm -hmm. Like, you know what I mean? Like you, like there's some, you could have been like going on the, the, the Esalen circuit uh -huh. and having a retreat center and bringing Westerners and saying like, this is the answer. This is the, this is the drug that's going to open your mind. Uh -huh. I'm curious you know, what, what, your, what your relationship was to ayahuasca and to the industry that has grown up around it since the Cosmic Serpent was, was published. Mm -hmm. Well, um, when I wrote that book, um, uh, I started writing it in 93 and I finished it in 95. It was published in French in 95. Then I translated it myself into English and it got published in 98. In 93, when I started writing it, I mean, frankly, in Europe, there was hardly anybody who had ever heard of ayahuasca. There were a few Santo Daime people in Spain or, or Holland, 
but I mean, internet didn't even exist at that point. So, you know, it's, it, it started existing in 95, right when I published the, the French version of the book. Um, but um, when I wrote the book, um, it seemed extremely improbable to me that Westerners would become interested in this foul tasting brew that makes you vomit and see terrifying serpents. Really, I mean, you know, Westerners, they like pills that taste of nothing, you know, LSD, MDMA, you name it. But, but stuff that is, uh, that, you know, um, Westerners don't like vomiting. They don't know how to vomit. They don't, they don't want to know from vomiting yet. Yet, actually, it was a great surprise that uh, following 1995 and those years, ayahuasca uh, actually did become uh, well trendy and, and quickly too. Um, and just why it did is, a, is another question, but I'll, I'll try to answer this one first. When I wrote the book, uh, to me, it was not an ayahuasca book. Uh, first of all, it was a book about Amazonian knowledge. Um, and uh, I, I remain to this day an activist for the rights of indigenous people's knowledge. So, you know, that's why I didn't go on the uh, on the guru circuit. Um, you know, it's a I consider these to be serious questions, and it's the 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 bottom line is getting some respect for indigenous systems of knowledge. And so that's what it's been about from the start. That's what it's about today. And, it, and for me, that means taking science seriously as well um, and taking both forms of knowledge seriously and building bridges between them. And, um, you know, that, that takes a lot of reading, a lot of serious work and, and avoiding the, the guru circuit as much as possible. Um, you know, so that's, a, that's a, an easy answer to, to, to the question. Um, and then, um, uh, I mean, for example, why uh, The Cosmic Serpent was not perceived as a tobacco book, um, I'm not quite sure. I think the word tobacco is mentioned more frequently than the word ayahuasca in that book. And there's, there's all kinds of surprising information, scientific information as well about tobacco, but actually tobacco has bad press, people think cigarettes, and actually you know, ayahuasca is the exotic and attractive other, whereas tobacco is this kind of dirty habit that we don't want to know about. Um, so maybe that's why um, it got perceived as, a, as an ayahuasca book. And then there, there is this, though, that question, all this, this, this uh, development of interest in ayahuasca. Finally, you know, I, I know a lot of people um, denounce ayahuasca tourism or whatever. Um, you know, I actually think anthropology is a form of tourism. Um, <laughs> I, I do not put myself above being a tourist, you know, uh, even I, I could say, yes, I'm an anthropologist and I'm an activist for the rights of indigenous people. So uh, tourists, please move aside. I have some serious work to attend to, you know, but actually, no, I'm getting on an airplane like anybody else, and uh, uh, I'm from out of town, and I ask a lot of stupid questions too, and um, and so there it is. I, I think the anthro the anthropologist maybe stays a bit longer than the average tourist, but but even that is getting blurred. Um, and then when it comes to ayahuasca tourists, well, a lot of them have serious intentions. Some of them may be fairly uh, awkward and. Uh, and so on, or maybe even culturally insensitive because they, they don't pay attention or they don't know how to pay attention to these quite different cultures. But still, if you look at it in historical perspective, it's the first time in 500 years that Westerners are showing up in the Amazon and saying to uh, indigenous people there, we're interested in your knowledge and in your plants. We'd like to study with you. We'd like you to heal us. And we're prepared to pay you something for it. Where we haven't come to extract it as usual, we'll actually pay you good money for it. Well, actually paying good money creates all kinds of inequalities locally. It's not without its problems, but still, white people putting a value on the knowledge of indigenous Amazonian people 
uh, with real cash is, um, I think, a lot better than killing them, taking their lands away, uh, drilling for oil on their territories, and so forth. Um, and it actually is. Uh, there, there are all kinds of exchanges, intercultural exchanges on the ayahuasca frontier between interested Europeans and North Americans and, uh, and uh, South American people. And uh, it's not always on an even footing. Um, it does sometimes have that extractive uh, tinge to it because often, I mean, you know, Westerners can't help themselves. They, they're, they're like, they are like vampires. You know, you, you, the, the, if, as soon as you turn your back, they'll be extracting something. I mean, they extract ayahuasca. This is the one thing the indigenous people that I've spoken to about. So how do you feel about all these ayahuasca tourists? They say, oh, if they want to come and learn and study and take it seriously, fine. Um, what we don't like is when they take the ayahuasca back with them, that this, that, that, that extraction is somewhat problematic. Not all indigenous people say this. Um, those that are involved in the ayahuasca economy don't say it. But if you look at those that aren't, people, uh, elders who are involved with teaching indigenous knowledge and who have no immediate interest in the ayahuasca economy, that's what they'll say. They prefer that people come and study with them, but it becomes problematic as soon as there's like the extraction of matter, simply because it's, a, it's been a very delicate subject over the last 500 years, as the vampire story I told uh, earlier uh, shows. So um, yes, there are complexities in that whole ayahuasca thing, but it is also a, a precious and rather unique opportunity for Amazonian people to um, show their stuff, show their plants, show their techniques, show what they know. Um, you know, so yeah. it, it's it's an interesting and complex intercultural interface. Yeah, and you know, you gave a beautiful talk about that at the ICERS conference. That's on, it's on YouTube and talking about some, you know the, the complexities. And something that, that seems to me to be a very double-edged sword is the idea that you talk about in the Cosmic Serpent and that ayahuascaros and you know, dabblers that I know talk about is that the plant is the teacher. And my concern there is that as, as, a, as a Westerner, I can, I can then say, well, I, I now have direct communication with the plant. I don't need some Amazonian shaman to mediate for me. And I know how easy it is for me to get an idea in my head and think that it's divinely inspired. <laughs> right. So so how do how mm. do we how do we stay humble while acknowledging that we can get, you know, Icaros and wisdom and insight and communication directly from a plant and still center the indigenous knowledge that created the technology and pre can present it to us? Yeah, well. That's a, a good question and a tough question. And um, I mean, I know at this point, the cat's way out of the bag, um, you know, and so that there, there are people who um, have ayahuasca in upstate New York or wherever, and, um, and they're ayahuasqueros and they're organizing sessions and, and there it is, they've been doing it for years and um, you know, I guess some know what they're doing, uh, others less so. Um, and so then, um, you know, what, I don't see where my opinion is really uh, um, relevant to them, but I'll still give my well, opinion. Well, let's say, want... let's, yeah, let's say to people who are, you know, I am very interested, uh -huh. right? I want to do, I want to, I want to learn, I want to grow, I want to, advocate and understand indigenous systems and this yeah. appears to be a pathway and I want to do it well. Yeah, uh, no, no, for sure. Well, um, in the uh, uh, many indigenous uh, Amazonian societies, they'll tell you that uh, um, fully formed competent ayahuasqueros have been at it for 20, 30 years. And before that, you're still learning. Uh, it doesn't mean that you can't administer on your own, but it does mean that you consider that there's a maestro above you and that you don't really have that um, 
uh, kind of knowledge. You're not a full professor yet. Hmm. Um, and so, you know, you need to be uh, more uh, humble. You need to go and see your professor regularly. And that means not just the plant teacher, but also um, the maestro. And, you know, I guess the analogy is something like mountain climbing, which is that um, when you learn how to climb a mountain, it's true, it's finally your body and the mountain that are in question. Um, but you do need a mountain guide who has experience and who says a little bit to the left, a little bit to the right. In the analogy, so the plant is the mountain. The plant teacher, the mountain is going to teach you how to, is going to be, you're interacting with the mountain that you're actually going to learn how to climb a mountain. But given that you're a beginner, or even just a, 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 a you've only been doing it a few years, and then suddenly you're climbing these high peaks in the Himalayas, you, you need a guide. You know, I mean, uh, you're no world-class alpinist. You're just a... Uh, a dude who likes to climb local mountains. Um, you know, so you may be good on your local mountains and so on, but you're still only just learning how to climb mountains. And you can do a lot of work on your own, but actually if you really want to go and climb those high peaks, you need to collaborate with, with somebody who has that kind of high peak knowledge. Otherwise you're going to go into risky territory. And I think that the risky territory that some of these folks go into, the ones who say, okay, I've been down to South America for three months. I trained with a maestro for three months. I got it. The plant is the teacher. Thank you very much. I brought a couple of leaders back with me. And now it's just between the plant and myself. I know what I'm doing. I have the power. I have the knowledge. And I can administer it to other people. Well, um, the, the, they're not, they're not going to fall off a mountain and kill themselves. But they might well fall into... Um, self-importance, ego inflation, uh, abuse of other people. In other words, I think that's also one of the things that the, the, the maestro does is, is help cut down that, that ego that tends to grow uh, when you're learning uh, with the plant. So there are all those aspects of the, uh, and you know, I think that more broadly, instead of asking your question, I mean, I'm thankful that you asked me that question, but I think, that it's a question that, that more people interested in ayahuasca should ask indigenous Amazonian experts. In other words, if we're gonna talk about mountain climbing, let's get some world-class mountaineers from Nepal and wherever, hey, Switzerland, and you know, ask them. They're the people, uh, I'd be just like a, a journalist who writes about mountain climbing, you know? Um, but uh, the, the uh, it, it would be for a question to uh, a guy. So I wrote this book with Rafael Chanchari. He's a, 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 a high level Amazonian expert on these plants. It would be interesting to put that question to him. You know, so here are these gringos. They haven't trained that long with uh, uh, a maestro and now they're taking the medicine back. And, you know, what do you suggest that they do? I, I'm not sure what he would reply. He might reply, come down to South America regularly and make sure that they, they follow, you know, advanced classes. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's what, that's where the, there is a tension is that in, in the indigenous tradition where they know about this medicine, they consider that, I mean, you never stop learning so that you're always kind of in school. And that even when you've been doing it for 30 years and you're a maestro, you're still learning. You need that humility of considering that there's so much more to know compared to what you actually think you know. Um, when I've seen quite a few ayahuasqueros, once they start uh, serving out the medicine, they, 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 they may kind of mouth that humility, but they don't necessarily always demonstrate it. And, you know, there's... There's always a lot of, I see a lot of, uh, I mean, these are power plants and the people who are interested in them and, and who consume them and who distribute them have an interest in power. And actually the more they work with the plants, the more that uh, interest uh, becomes pronounced. And this is something that, that, I mean, I actually don't drink ayahuasca in the West, here in Europe or in North America. 
but I'm lucky to go to Peru regularly. So that's a, another question. Um, you know, so I have a privileged position. But the, 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 the little that I do see uh, in ayahuasca drinking circles, uh, they, they're, they're rife with, with uh, problematic power dynamics. Not all of them. I'm sure there are some very fine ones out there. But um, there's a lot of that going on. And I, I don't see enough discussion of uh, the hygiene of power. In other words, once you know how to work with these plants and you can actually bring about change in the world by working with them, make people feel better or whatever it is, that power uh, is going to infuse you. And then it really depends on how you handle that. It can, it can go to your head fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. um, you know, so that um, how does one handle being a successful ayahuasquero? What, what does one have to do uh, not to turn into um, a, an idiot? Um, well, I mean, this is a, a theme that I think deserves broader discussion. I mean, maybe these discussions are happening and I'm just not aware of them. Mm. Well, and I think, you know, maybe tobacco in the Western world is a, is a, a wonderful, uh, you know, case study of what happens when you treat a powerful plant um, as, you know, as a means to an end from the tobacco industry itself. You know, I'm here in North Carolina, sort of the, the you know, the world, global center of, of, the, of the tobacco hegemony. Um, you know, like one of the things I loved about the new is that you reintroduced me to tobacco and, it, you know, kind of like, oh, I've been like feuding with you my whole life. You know, you're, you've always, since I was five years old and I, begged my father with tears in my eyes to stop smoking the occasional cigar because I didn't want him to die. Like it's been a villain. And this, this book like put it in a completely different perspective for me. But of course, it's still a villain in, in, in our relationship to it. Well, um, I think that ayahuasca and tobacco are, are very different uh, plants. I mean, the, the first thing is that uh, tobacco is clearly poisonous. In other words, um, if you could extract uh, the, the pure nicotine from a single tobacco leaf and then inject it into your blood, you would die instantaneously. As a, one pure drop of nicotine kills you. Uh, the same cannot be said of uh, anything inside ayahuasca, you know, so it's, uh, I mean, uh, nicotine is essentially an insecticide from the plant's point of view. Um, so, I mean, that's the first thing. The, the second thing is that ayahuasca, for the moment, has managed, unlike any of these other shamanic plants that have been turned into products like uh, uh, tobacco, cigarettes, and coca, cocaine, um, to uh, ayahuasca has managed to travel with its ritual or with its harness. It means um, it's so strong that those who uh, work with it know that you've got to ritualize it, use it at precise moments and in precise spaces. That's what a ritual is. And so that, you know, so that you don't do it any old where, you don't do it when there are other people around, and then you sing and so on and so on. So there are certain procedures. And the, as ayahuasca has not been turned into, I don't know, peanut butter or chewing gum or, um, but if, if we take uh, tobacco, it has been weakened so that blonde Virginia white man tobacco um, has 20 times less nicotine. So the first thing is that you do not get that psychoactive rush that shamanic tobacco gives you and that makes it almost visionary or hallucinogenic depending on the doses. You get just enough nicotine to fire up the neurons. They're like, bam, 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 bam. But, but you never get the gear fully in there. And so 20 minutes later, you want to light another one up. And that's how they calibrated these nicotine delivery devices, which are cigarettes. So they took the powerful plant teacher, weakened it into this thing that doesn't really deliver, and then sauced it with 600 different chemicals, most of which are poisonous when you burn them, and, and calibrated it so that you want to smoke 
20 every day, one after another. And this is the contrary of a ritual. A ritual means you define a precise space and time to use it. Here, it's completely de-ritualized. It's complete, it's that the, the cigarettes were turned into these things that you, you could smoke. Actually, the whole point was to get people smoking as often as possible. And that was also part of the toxicity. So yes, they've, they've taken this powerful plant teacher, weakened it, turned it into a caricature of itself, uh, um, uh, transformed it with chemicals. I mean, uh, you, you probably couldn't do much worse. Um, and, and so, and what do people learn from this weakened and uh, modified plant teacher? Hardly anything. So wait, let's, let's take that from the top again. A powerful plant teacher that when you get to the end, you're learning nothing, you're poisoning yourself, you're not getting a nicotine delivery by any means, and all you wanna do is light up another one shortly. It's called addiction. Um, yeah, well, that's what the um, uh, tobacco industry uh, did. And that's, that's how all Western, when you say tobacco to people, even if it's not now a cigarette, they have other ways, other devices or vaporizers or, or, or whatever. But that's how people think that one should work with tobacco is made for pleasurable smoking. That's why you smoke, um, you know, and so, um, but no, actually, this Amazonian plant was not ever used for pleasure and was always used for rather um, difficult uh, uh, attempts to gain knowledge about the world. It's a, uh, a plant teacher. It's a serious entity, a powerful entity, even a, a fearful one. And, and you can get many things from it, but it's, it's hard to master. So you have to have a kind of a hygiene and a procedure if you, if you want to work with this plant. I should say immediately that it's not my plant. I, I do not work with tobacco, but I, I have seen how Amazonian people do it. And um, it's a serious enterprise. It has nothing uh, to do with lounging around and casually smoking for pleasure. Well, I mean, you, you know, your, your story about the effects of the, the, the time you um, took shamanic tobacco, like I was a little jealous, like, oh, I could use a hit of that, right? You talked about becoming confident, powerful, predatory, and being able to decades later sort of re-embody that energy when you need it. I'm like, damn. Yeah, actually, uh, it's true. Um, I, I wouldn't, um, you know, I wouldn't recommend, it's, the, these are, I don't think anybody should recommend a psychoactive plant or substance to anybody because they're, it's always risky. And I was also going to say about tobacco, I mean, finally, it's, it's, it's kind of unsafe at any speed, as Ralph Nader used to say about the Mustang. Um, the, um, uh, tobacco, uh, it, it, it has such a profound impact on uh, our bodies and on our minds that um, riskless tobacco um, is kind of like a contradiction in terms. Um, I think that ayahuasca is um, way safer if what if that's the criterion mm -hmm. than tobacco, but that's a that's a, a another question. So I wouldn't recommend either ayahuasca or tobacco or any other psychoactive plant or substance to anybody. Everybody's got to make up their own mind if they want to do that. But that said, it's true that that experience of uh, eating uh, one single dose of strong shamanic tobacco paste once um, and then having this uh, uh, powerful body-based experience of whiskers growing, teeth feeling sharper, taste of blood in the mouth, uh, eyeing the chickens that are clucking around, deciding not to attack them um, in my enlightened state, and so on. Uh, and then uh, um, at the same time that I knew that I didn't believe in Jaguar transformation, having a very uh, convincing uh, bodily impression 
that that's exactly what was uh, going on. So in other words, having the uh, uh, a deeply imprinted and physical impression of what feeling like a feline might be. Yeah, it's true. I found that uh, precious and, and quite useful. Um, you know, especially, I, I don't know, like, a, oddly enough, like, with public speaking, you know, there are a few, like, there are these moments before they give you the mic, so you're sitting there, and and you're just, and maybe they're saying, oh, and so the next speaker, blah, 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 and they kind of, and then people are kind of looking at you, you're just sitting there. I mean, those could be moments when, depending on, instead of getting nervous or, or whatever, I, I would uh, just think about that um, feline feeling and, you know, slow it all right down. All those human words coming out of the other people's mouths were sort of like uh, water off a cat's back at that point. And then just getting up there and, and delivering the goods and, you know, summoning that kind of, um, what is it, confident animal energy um, into the body, uh, because that's where you get nervous. I mean, obviously, I'm not saying that uh, nervousness doesn't go through the brain, but it manifests in the body. So if you can actually get your body, you can trick your body into feeling like a, a cool cat uh, right before you uh, speak. You know, it, it actually uh, gives dividends. Yeah, and some part of me, um, you know, wants to say that the, you know, the, the mother of tobacco looked at you assessed the work you would need to do in the world and said, well, this you know, here's your tool. Here's your gift. Yeah, uh, you're, I, I, you're taking you know, on oil companies and the World Bank and, you know, lots, lots of people with a lot more money than you've ever raised. Well, I, that's certainly one way that one can uh, read it. Um, and um, note that uh, if that is uh, pertinent, um, the message was not you need to do this 150,000 more times in your life <laughs> or you need to do this 20 times a day every day no it was okay there you go now you got it yeah you know you you got the message uh, goodbye mm -hmm. um and i think that uh it's possible to work with tobacco like that I actually think that the, these uh, power plants like ayahuasca and tobacco, I mean, uh, there's nothing like not using them. In other words, uh, you know, there's a time to drink ayahuasca, but there's really a time for not drinking it. And, and, that, uh, and so this may sound like Chinese gibberish, but um, not drinking ayahuasca is an activity. Um, you know, that it's, it's an important part. It's kind of like exhaling is an important part of breathing just as much as inhaling is. Mm. Um, except that with ayahuasca, I mean, for, for every inhalation, I would take 10,000 exhalations. Um, you know, that the, um, uh, so it really does not mean that I will never again drink ayahuasca. In fact, uh, I'm looking forward to, to drinking some. I haven't had ayahuasca since the, the lockdown, in fact. Um, so that's uh, almost a year and a half now. Um, so the next time I get the opportunity to do so, I know that uh, I'll be looking forward to it. Actually, you know, I find it's, it's uh, an experience kind of like going to the dentist. In other words, it's a bit of an ordeal each time. It always kicks me in the pants. And it's not something that, you know, I'm in a hurry to repeat. I see people who are drinking ayahuasca every week or every two weeks, and they get into this thing where, I mean, hey, I think it's something that, like, you know, I do it once or twice a year, maybe a, sometimes three, and then, but if a couple of years go by and it's, it's fine too, um, that, uh, and that all those months of not drinking are months where you can integrate your previous sessions, you can read books, you can get your body in shape. And, you know, that's, a, that's part of, there, there's, it's part of a whole, in fact. And that, um, you know, uh, maybe also as a Westerner, where here we are, Western worlds, machines, computers, um, all this stuff that, that we have to deal with, it's, it's, it's difficult 
I, if, to be in that world and to be immersed in the ayahuasca world at the same time. And so that the, if you're going to have a life in the Western world, I think that only occasionally going into ayahuasca makes it more manageable. Mm -hmm. And that going in there too often, actually then things get pretty complicated. And so that um, one way of, of getting a, a grip on the strength of that particular power plant, well, is to keep it at a distance. And that means not to ingest it too often. And then to make the most of the times when you actually do ingest it. Um, and, you know, to speak clearly at this point, um, I don't know, I've probably had ayahuasca 60, 70 times, you know. Um, a lot of people would consider that uh, not much. And then a lot of people would consider that enormous. So, um, and, and anyway, it's not a contest. Um, but I think that, um, you know, there it is, even for somebody like myself who writes books about the subject, one doesn't need to drink it 500 times to, to sort of uh, know the subject and be able to discuss it and then also to have a life and not take oneself for a guru, you know? And it, it's really, it, it, for me, it remains about, it's a, it's a plant that is about the indigenous Amazonian people. It's an Amazonian plant. And, and uh, it's interesting that way. It's also therapeutic. It teaches us about the human mind. Um, it's an interesting thing. And um, yeah, I think that the, the way to sort of know about it and to work with it is to, uh, do it uh, with parsimony, in other words, infrequently and prudently. So I want to talk about the latest book, Plant Teachers. Um, so I have to admit, when I first got a copy, I thought it was going to be very different. Like I was imagining sort of the trajectory of the cosmic serpent and like, what's he going to come up with now? Like that other, it was like so amazing, the you know, the DNA and maybe coming on spaceships and, and, and Francis Crick and I'm thinking, like, what's this one going to be? Yeah. And I started reading it to my wife. We were you know, in, in bed. I would, we would, and it's got, you know, basically four main chapters and they, they kind of go back and forth. And it was like watching Titanic with her. We're like, I was really interested in the science chapters. Uh. And she was really interested in the story chapters. Uh -huh. um, and I'm curious, like it went in a very different direction. And I'm curious, like, who, who is the audience for plant teachers? And what, what, uh -huh. what was the goal in writing it? Because it's a, it's a very uh, measured book. There's almost no speculation. Yep. Yeah. Oh, you're so right. Um, well, it, it all started with tobacco. And suddenly, uh, after all these years, um, it's not that I was frustrated that Cosmic Serpent didn't get perceived as a tobacco book. Um, but it's true, after hearing so many times that it was an ayahuasca book, it, it, it got to me that it was kind of funny that, so here's a world where like a billion people or more smoke tobacco, and only a couple of million are drinking ayahuasca. And yet, we only ever hear about ayahuasca and nobody's talking about tobacco. So. And I thought, well, finally, the time has come to try to bring Amazonian know-how about tobacco to uh, the citizens of the world. That's the audience. So if you are a person, an adult, who has a consuming interest in this plant, here's what you need to know from an Amazonian perspective and from a scientific perspective. It's, um, and so it, as you say, there's no speculation. It's an attempt to bring together these two different uh, ways of knowing um, to show the value. Uh, the, so the, the point is also to show the value of indigenous Amazonian knowledge. Tobacco is an Amazonian plant. The indigenous cultures in the Amazon have know-how that's formulated in, um, uh, different terms than uh, scientific knowledge, but actually that's one of the things the book shows that when, if you give the microphone to an indigenous Amazonian who, who knows the subject, um, 
what uh, Rafael Chanchari is uh, my co-author's name, uh, what he says actually is uh, corresponds to what science has recently established. Mm -hmm. And so, yes, uh, one also learns that indigenous Amazonian knowledge about tobacco is confirmed by science and, and vice versa. And then you can choose, uh, well, there's a chapter from the indigenous point of view, I take it your wife uh, preferred those chapters. <laughs> yeah. A and then you were the Leonardo DiCaprio in the Titanic. Yeah. And uh, so you preferred the scientific chapters. Um, but uh, actually these are two different languages and they, they complement each other. And I think that the open-minded citizen of the world who has an interest in tobacco gains from going over both chapters. And so that you, you know what the Amazonian experts say, you know how they think about it. You know, they think that tobacco is a powerful person and that uh, working with that entity, uh, there's certain ways of going about it. It can help you do certain things. Um, it can also be dangerous. And so, so there it is. Um, and then, I think that knowing uh, about the, the molecules that are inside the plant and how they impact on the body and all the different hormones that they affect and working on the brain and the organs and the blood and so forth. Yeah, that it, it, it never hurts anybody to know about, um, about that. It's true, it's not always everybody's cup of tea to read about uh, nicotine and, and other molecules. Um, but still, so there's, there's the audience if you're an, uh, and then uh, to, to write it all in language that is accessible to more or less anybody. In other words, there's no complicated words like epistemology or whatever. Um, it, it's just, and actually that's also the beauty of Rafael Chanchari and Amazonian knowledge. You won't find him using any long words either. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of experience about the plant, how to work with it and, and what conditions it, it can treat. But, uh, you know, you don't have to be a medical doctor. You don't even need a university education, nothing. If you're interested in the plant, I'd say, you know, any, any one of the 1.2 billion smokers in the world would do themselves a favor by reading this short book that, that provides a gamut of knowledge. It has the indigenous point of view, the scientific point of view. It's up to date. It's basically everything you need to know if you're gonna start working with this powerful plant. And then having done two crisp chapters like that on tobacco, it seemed to me, oh, well, we could just do the same with ayahuasca, that wouldn't hurt. There, here's another Amazonian plant teacher. This one is getting all kinds of attention. There's maybe a thousand times less users than tobacco, but still, here are two powerful plant teachers from the Amazon, and um, they have all kinds of attention or press, one could say, not always very clear. They're, they're kind of controversial plants, both of them. So here's an attempt to be concise, clear-eyed, open-minded, and to give interested readers around the world um, what they need to know if they're going to work with those plants, the end. No speculation. You know, it's at the reader's service. Um, and at the same time, it tries to kind of tell it in a story form. It really is the encounter of two fellows with two different systems of knowledge, their conversations, and then how you can get a back and forth between in indigenous way of looking, scientific way of looking, look at how they work together. And then finally, the reader makes up his or her mind as to, you know, you can say, forget the scientific chapters. I don't need them. I'll just like use the, those, I'll just go by the two uh, indigenous knowledge chapters and voila. Sure, you can, you know, that uh, the, the reader gets to situate herself uh, wherever in the gamut. Personally, I think that uh, speaking both languages is better and you know, reading all the chapters and, and taking it all into account. And you know, I think that saying that tobacco has a powerful mother on the one hand, 
and saying that it contains substances that impact deeply on our hormones on another is not at all contradictory. And uh, Rafael Chanchari, my co-author, um, says the same. You know, when he was telling me about uh, the, the mother of tobacco, I asked him, so do you think there's a relationship between nicotine and the mother of tobacco? And he said, oh yes, uh, uh, surely we need neurons and nicotine to perceive the mother of tobacco. <laughs> Obvious. <laughs> um, you know, so uh, they, it, it all goes together. It all fits together. Um, and I think that's also part of the message. So what, one thing I loved about the book, and as I'm, I'm thinking about as an author myself, that I was a little embarrassed to say, like, if I had written a book in this way, it wouldn't have occurred to me to credit a co-author as the co-author, <laughs> right? Ah. It's like, oh, we had a couple of conversations, and then I went and I wrote this book. And for understanding, you know, your work with Nouvelle Planète and your, and your activism over the past 30 years, it made perfect sense. Like, ah, this is his knowledge that he's sharing. Of course, he gets credit and I assume financial consideration as 50, well. 50-50. 50-50. And it, I, it, you know, it struck me that that was odd to me, an odd choice at uh -huh. first. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I actually think that I did myself a favor by doing that. In other words, uh, it, it may seem like admirable or whatever, but... Um, uh, once you, uh, I, I moved beyond the idea that I was the author and the authority and the anthropologist with the doctorate and so forth. And it was just obvious that, you know, he was the guy who actually knew the plants. He was the guy who actually had the knowledge. And I was more like a scribe. And so that you, uh, but yeah, I mean, you, you, there's a certain know-how and how to build a book and how to read the scientific literature and how to how to crunch it and synthesize it. Sure, um, but it, it actually was a collaboration, and so and then just making it uh, clear that way, um, I think it it makes the book stronger. Uh, it, it's simply true. And I think it's also, I, I don't know, I mean, the, I, I'm certainly not the first anthropologist to co-author a book with uh, uh, indigenous um, uh, experts. But in this case, what, what I like about it, I mean, you know, there's an, like an admirable book, it's called uh, The Falling Sky, and it's by uh, Devi Kopenawa, uh, Yanomami, and Bruce Albert. And Bruce Albert is a French anthropologist who, who actually gave the, the microphone to Devi Kopenawa who is a Yanomami shaman from Brazil. And, and it's just a wonderful, wonderful book. It has many, uh, it has a lot about uh, the indigenous perspective on, on European people. For example, Davi Kopenawa comes to Europe and you know, it, it's, it's actually, uh, um, he, he calls us the people of the merchandise, obsessed with our merchandise. It's, it's really worth a read. But in that book, uh, Bruce Albert, the anthropologist, uh, kind of disappears. It's, it's all Davi Kopenawa in the first person. The book is by Kopenawa and the anthropologist. So the anthropologist is a scribe. He interviewed the guy for years and turned it into a book. And it's all in Davi Kopenawa's voice. And it's a beautiful thing. I'm not at all criticizing the book. What I felt was that a true dialogue that like what I would like to see in the world is a true dialogue between indigenous knowledge and science, because I think that they have a lot to say to each other about plants, about the world that we live in. And that the point is to try to figure out how, how, to, how to get these two systems of knowledge talking to each other. And that the, 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 the a true dialogue is when the, the positions are clear. In other words, sure, I, I was the first author. It's Narbi and Chanchari. Narbi's asking the questions. Chanchari's answering the questions. I'm, I'm sort of saying, oh, now wait, I don't get that. Could you be more clear? Or wait, if you say this, could you be? And so that actually, it really is a dialogue. It's I, not I, just... I, I love that at one point you say, wait, and you inter I, I interrupted him. <laughs> right. Like that was so, such a charming <laughs> detail that you could so easily have left out. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, you know, so that, because that's how, what a true dialogue uh, is, so that, you know, that we'd be co-authors, 
but we're coming from different systems of knowledge. They don't always agree. We're trying to find common ground, but you can't always. And so there, there is a sort of, it's, it is slightly unstable, but that what, that's what makes it interesting. Um, and, and that's what it makes it real too. You know, nobody's on a pedestal. And that, uh, you know, so the, the point was to try to give an example of, well, this is how, this is how uh, scientifically informed uh, people and uh, indigenous Amazonian people can talk to each other about these serious subjects that interest us. And, and that actually by, by bringing together the two perspectives, one reaches a fuller understanding. And that's what I submit to readers finally. It's not just a small little book that gives you what you need to know about these two plants. It's that, don't you think now that you've read it that actually associating different forms of knowledge like this gives you a more complete picture of what we're talking about. Now, of course, people are free to say, no, I don't think. I think that science is the only valid thing and the indigenous way is, is uh, worthless or, or vice versa. Some people might say the shaman made sense, but as soon as you started talking about molecules, I couldn't stand it. I mean, you know, pe people are free to, to situate themselves, but I would submit uh, that actually what most people would get if they read the book with an open mind is that two systems of knowledge discussing these plants is better than one and that you get a, a, a fuller understanding of what we're talking about. Yeah, and I was wondering, and first of all, it's, we're, we're over the time that you've graciously uh, agreed to, so I wanna make sure that it's okay, it's okay to keep talking. Yeah, let's give another uh, 10 minutes, okay? Okay, beautiful. Thank you. Um, that, like, one of the one of the audiences I imagined you talking to is scientists, mm. whom you you describe as having you know si sort of scienced all over the uh, indigenous people, and really you know come as extractors of knowledge, not giving back, not even giving back in terms of respect. And I'm wondering whether sort of par part of the goal here was to demonstrate to scientists the the benefits of, of of engaging in true dialogue definitely and and it's also true and um I, i've been quite uh proud of the ayahuasca community um uh writ large like at recent uh conferences like in in girona the icers conference there is this um uh, wish to include indigenous expertise and to find ways of um, collaborating with indigenous people, recognizing uh, their knowledge and breaking with the model of the past, which was that, you know, it, it was only the scientific way that was worth anything, even if we were talking about ayahuasca. Um, and uh, so, um, yeah, there. When I hear a lot uh, from people who want to organize panels that discuss this question, and and there, there really is a kind of an openness that one can feel um, within the scientific community, especially when it comes to ayahuasca. And so this book was a, a sort of modest, small um, contribution, which is just an example. Is actually, hey, you know what? Having a dialogue with an indigenous expert on ayahuasca is so easy. All you gotta do is sit down and talk with the person, ask questions, listen to their answers. Maybe you might not understand when they start talking about the mother of tobacco and so on, you might start spacing out. It doesn't matter. Um, and actually when they do start talking about the plant as a teacher, as a person, as the mother of tobacco, et cetera, Actually, there's often some interesting stuff behind that kind of metaphorical language that um, you might just get some ideas from. And so um, it's actually, it's easy to do and it's worth paying attention to the stuff you don't understand. Um, and so, so there it is. Uh, in other words, it's not a sort of theoretical panel discussion. Mm -hmm. It's uh, a book that already exists, it's concrete, it speculates 0%. Uh, 
It brings together solid knowledge on two sides. Um, it's useful, I think, to, to readers. It actually comes up with some suggestions about, you know, uh, smoking better, for example, smoking mindfully, smoking uh, not all the time um, with an intention. You know, if you're going to smoke, smoke seriously, smoke well, and smoke less, smoke better tobacco, make sure it's clean, etc. You know, so th this is not a it's not metaphysics by any means. Um, and, and so there it is. Um, yeah, I, you know, the, the smallest common denominator, that, that's the kind of idea. Here is something small. It's not incredibly mind-blowing, um, but actually it, it exists and, and it already is a dialogue between two systems of knowledge. As of now, you can't say that it's impossible or, or whatever. It's easy. All you got to do is do it. Just do it. So one, one thing that I was missing from the book that, that I was sad about at first, and I think I'm, I'm, I'm beginning to understand it, but like when, when you, in your talks and in your work, you're very interested in this idea of, of personhood, of human beings be, being like, you know, there's like the word nature meaning to exclude humans, that we need to learn just to survive and to not destroy the world and these other peoples, that we, that we need to learn this. And I was kind of hoping like you get to that part and instead it's like, you know, you're gonna let the indigenous knowledge system speak for themselves if we're willing to, to do it. So, you know, another book I've read this year and someone I've, I've, I've interviewed a couple of times is Tyson young Caporta who is an Australian um, indigenous person who wrote a book called Sand Talk, which I think is subtitled How Indigenous Knowledge Can Save Civilization. Okay, I'll take a look at that. Um, and point, you know, from the same, the same perspective that we, you know, we need these voices. We need to be able to, you know, in his case, un believe in ghosts and, and spirits and... Um, you know that this is this is an antidote to the crazy deadness of our culture, um, and I'm I'm curious what your thoughts were. And like you didn't include any of that mm -hmm. in this book, mm -hmm. and but but it's clearly the, one of the most important things. Mm -hmm. know. Yeah, you know, and I, I I hear you. Uh, I agree with you. I was actually tempted a little bit to go in that direction, as you know. I've given a bunch of talks that go in that direction. Um, <laughs> And so actually there's stuff that I've already put out there that, that kind of gets into this uh, to a certain extent. Um, and I, I may well um, put it into a book at some point, but then, um, you know, um, I guess different people have different ways of writing books, but in, in my case, it's, it's like you try to get something, a coherent whole, and you don't try to do everything at the same time in a single book. Um, this book, it seemed that to, to do what I've been talking about for the last half hour, bringing together two different systems of knowledge, looking at two Amazonian plants that are kind of controversial and well known in the world, but misunderstood, looking at them from these two perspectives, and then bringing it all together so that people get the basic information that they need to know about these powerful plants is one small, single, coherent book. And that putting all these other important, fascinating subjects into there would disrupt that capsule. The book is meant to be a small capsule that, that does what it says it's going to do. And I think it actually does that. Um, and in particular, by granting uh, half the space to my Indigenous co-author, it's true. I let him have the monopoly of uh, the discussion of personhood of, of nature, um, because he's the expert in that domain. I happen to agree now with that point of view, and I think it's important ecologically, as you were just saying. Um, and if, if it were just a book under my name and I was writing about what I've got uh, ecologically, let's say, from uh, working with Indigenous people all these years, I'd certainly discuss the personhood that that you just brought up, but it would be another book. 
And I think this is something, sometimes you see this in books. You, you see that people, it's actually two different books and they put it into one single book. And so it's a big book, but it's actually, it kind of, it, it doesn't have that coherence because it, it should have been two books. Sometimes it should have been three books um, and it goes all over the place. I mean, I'm much happier to write one short coherent book that is a true capsule um, that maybe frustrates readers a little bit because they would have wanted some more. Well, they'll just have to read the next one, you know? <laughs> um, and actually now, now that I've written this small book with Raphael Chanchari on tobacco and ayahuasca, suddenly I thought, you know, I could, I could do a book on cannabis, just like this one. In other words, um, here's a powerful plant. Um, it's been somewhat misunderstood. It has a long history. Um, I have a long uh, personal experience working with it uh, as, a, as a teacher, inspired by Amazonian techniques. So what, uh, so I'd, I'd like to do a book about cannabis as a plant teacher, just like I did with Rafael about tobacco and ayahuasca. Um, cannabis is a Eurasian plant. I myself am Eurasian. Doesn't make me a, a world expert on cannabis, but I've got a long personal relationship with the plant. So in this case, I'll be playing the role of both the person with the personal experience with the plant and the scribe intellectual who crunches all the, the knowledge about the plant. But still, I'm not sure yet whether I, I'm only like a third of the way into writing it. I'm not sure whether the important question you bring up is going to be in there. I've toyed with the idea that, I mean, if you're going to talk about a plant as a teacher, then at some point you do have to talk about what this, the personhood of plants might be. So there would be a place in this cannabis book for the discussion that you were uh, talking about. Um, at the same time, if it uh, breaks the spell of the story that I'm telling about cannabis, I might not put it in there and keep it for yet another book. Mm -hmm. In other words, you know, um, that's also, it's the decisions on, on what books you want to craft. I, I like mine to be kind of lean, um, you know, uh, chiseled um, with as little fat as possible. And, you know, that if people say, oh, yes, but you didn't do this or you didn't do that, you know, you're right, I didn't do this, but uh, I, I did it on purpose. And there was a, this, the, this book was uh, busy doing other things. And that the important question that you bring up is would be for yet another one, it, or maybe it's just for a talk or for an article. I mean, these, these are ideas that are worth circulating in different forms. You know, I think uh, what a book is or should be has changed in the last 20, 30 years. I mean, in the old days, it was the way to get serious knowledge out there. Nowadays, I mean, there's all kinds of ways to get your points of view out there. Um, books are more like, they, I think they've got to be shorter. People have, you know, kind of less time. They're so busy reading other stuff on screens that, um, okay, so, and that's where kind of thinning it down, turning it into kind of a lean capsule that really does the job it says it's going to do. For me, that's a 21st century book. Um, the cosmic serpent was so 20th century. Uh, yeah, just, just, just got it in. The, <laughs> I'm kind of kidding like... around. <laughs> right. So, well, yeah, yeah. Well, Howie, it's been a pleasure talking with you. Oh, likewise. I'm, um, um, for people, so they should get the book "Plant Teachers: Ayahuasca, Tobacco, and the Pursuit of Knowledge" by you, Jeremy Narby, and Rafael Chanchari Pizzuri. And is there any other place that they go to follow you, you know, in this 21st century internet world? You're not, you know, you're not I, like I actually have a Facebook page and I kind of go on there once a week. And, you know, if I, I've okay. got an event coming up, I kind of say I'll be doing this out of the other. But, um, uh, you know, actually, if, if you if you don't have any news, it's, it's that I'm, I'm here. Um, uh, just think of me writing a, a book about cannabis. It'll take another couple of years. Um, otherwise, I'm. Um, I, because the, the lockdown has been, uh, I used to travel a lot more, give more talks and so forth, mm -hmm. but actually, um, so I'm, I'm back in the writing saddle at this point and okay. it feels pretty good. Well, I, and, I can't wait to read that book and I, I would love to talk to you about it when it comes out. 
All right. Well, I'll I'll, uh, I'll keep on smoking, and uh, and as soon as it's ready, you'll know about it. Awesome. This 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 that last comment will make my son very happy. <laughs> Vaporizing, actually. <laughs> Excellent. Jeremy Narby, thank you so much for all the work you have done. It's been tremendously impactful in my life, continues to be. And thank you so much for your generosity in talking today. Well, well thank you, Howie. You know, it means a lot uh, because it's been solitary work a lot. And then to hear uh, all the kind words you've been saying uh, uh, feels good. Thanks a lot. Oh, a pleasure. Take care. Thank you. So, thank you again. Ciao. Bye.